evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the MSF Korea Briefing Series Focus. My name is Bang Joo Hyun from the Communication Department for Doctors Without Borders Korea. Uh, first of all, I'd like to let you know that we are providing Korean and English simultaneous interpretation. If you need the interpretation service, you'll be able to see the interpretation button at the bottom. So please choose the language that you want to see. So Doctors Without Borders is an international organization that works in areas experiencing humanitarian crisis around the world, including armed conflicts, epidemics, natural disasters, and medically underserved areas. Our quarterly focus webinars aims to highlight ongoing or overlooked crises and share MSF's activities there. And that's the purpose of our webinar. So this year's first briefing wants to bring your attention to the ongoing crisis in Gaza Strip, which started last October. Uh, the crisis has been under spotlight since the end of the year. You probably saw on TV as well. It's a crisis that's been ongoing for a long time. MSF activities is still present in Gaza where the war is still raging. Our guest for the briefing is someone who worked in the Gaza Strip last November. He is Dr. Yuko Nakajima, is the General Director of MSF Japan and an emergency medicine uh, specialist and anesthesiologist. We will hear more about the situation from a presentation followed by a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please leave your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will cover them during the session. So before we begin the presentation, we want to share a video from the field. It's being captured by the staff in the field. And we will have Dr. Yuko for the presentation. Since the war started until now, I have been working nonstop, 24 hours, all the days. It's really, really difficult. I haven't seen this, this kind of injury and this severity of injury in the previous wars. There are major cases and all the cases include burns. Can you imagine to receive 100 case or 200 case a day, sometimes 500 injured patient a day. And the problem now is, is become more difficult because the other hospital have been evacuated. All the patient came to us. The cases that we see, they are the majority of patients, they are uh, female and children. But what hurt me a lot when I see a child, an, an innocent child injured, and uh, he need a major surgery, he lost his limb, and he's the last child. He's the only remnant of his family. And when he woke up from anesthesia, he asked to see his family. So this is really a heartbreaking situation. The difficulties that we face here is the lack of supplies, the lack of instrument. So the hospital, if, if, he, if no, in normal days, he, he ha, there's um, 300 patients. Now it's more than 1,000 patients. The patient, they are homeless because many of them are refugees within Gaza. And the other people, they have their houses were destroyed. They don't have the access to potable water. They, they, there's a lack of food, a lack of extremity. And some of them just get out from their houses with, with their, the clothes that they are, they are wearing. We know that we are in danger, in danger any time, but we will keep doing the same. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Yuko Nakajima. I am uh, president for MSF Japan. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share my experiences in Gaza, uh, which I've been in in uh, November through uh, December for three weeks. So I'm going to share my presentation. Um, Okay, and uh, yes, I would like to share what I've seen in the field and um, what we are doing in MSF Japan uh, for the situation in Gaza. Um, and uh, yes, it's I've worked with Dr. Hafiz, who was in that video uh, recently, and it is pretty heartbreaking to see everybody um, still, you know, to this day. And, um, you know, I know that many of them remained despite the worsening situation in Gaza. Uh, so, okay, so I will start my presentation. Um, okay, 
So just um, myself, so I'm a, an emergency physician. I am based in Atlanta, but before that, I have been an anesthesiologist in Japan. I graduated medical school in Japan and trained there for eight years before I went to the United States. So for MSF, I've joined uh, in 20, to 2010 was my first mission, starting with Nigeria, um, and then I've been in Peshawar, Pakistan, Idlib, Syria, South Sudan, uh, a whale, and then uh, Yemen, and then um, this is Hasake, Syria, and then um, near Mosul, Iraq. After that, I became president. I've done field visits in Ukraine, uh, Malawi, and then Kabul, Afghanistan. So I've done many of these uh, field assignments and also field visits. This time, most recently, I've been to Gaza, um, which I will say was most difficult, most extreme. Um, I've never been this uh, physically and mentally affected um, going and working in the field. Uh, so this was um, my experience in Gaza that I would like to talk about. Uh, just to say that this is not a new uh, project for MSF. MSF been, has been working in Gaza since 1918, so for a long, long time. So in the Gaza Strip, uh, as it says, uh, you know, MSF has several clinics, uh, burns and trauma, just holistic um, treatment such as physiotherapy, psychological care, occupational therapy, health education, and then some reconstructive surgery care, surgical care. And then in the West Bank as well, there's been primary care and psychological care, which MSF has had more than 300 locally hired staff that we've been working with. Since October 7th, those activities has kind of been on the pause, they have stopped. Uh, the locally hired staff have been inside and uh, sort of sheltering um, and wondering, you know, what, what is going to happen. Um, and so the regular activities had stopped. Uh, for us, we've been very, very um, concerned about the situation that happened um, since be knowing about what has been going on in Palestine and then this Ham Hamas attack on October 7th. So it's been on my mind. And then on October 14th, uh, a group of people in the pool uh, had a, received a call for an emergency to compose an emergency team. Um, and then I have volunteered to join the team. And uh, we've, after a waiting period, uh, we departed. And this was after actually, um, it was hard to coordinate a uh, green light to get into Gaza since it required um, approval uh, from uh, three parties, which was Hamas, uh, Israel, and Egypt. So that was pretty difficult and it took a while to depart and gather into Cairo, which was a base because we were entering from Al Arish um, and Rafa border. And so that took a little bit, but finally on October 29th, um, there was a call to actually depart and I departed uh, after that. Um, so from all over the world, so if you can see the team members, there's actually a total of 13 members, uh, international, uh, which gathered for an emergency response team. Um, and we all arrived in Cairo around that time. And the idea was to go to Gaza as soon as possible. But after arriving in Cairo, there was actually a little bit of uh, time and difficulty having all, all that coordination of the green light getting into Gaza. So as the pictures you can see, um, there was a lot of preparation, including the, the bags of supplies to, to actually be able to uh, live and support survive in Gaza uh, for at least 10 days, which was like canned foods, um, water, hygiene uh, items, toilet paper, and, and such. 
The team members, by the way, were meant to be able to operate independently um, by ourselves um, if we go in. Now, there was a lot of unknowns um, because it was the first team to go in after the Hamas attack. And um, so anyway, uh, we were gathered and we went in. So this is a map to just show um, what our route was. So we all gathered from Cairo, um, most from Europe, uh, two from South America and one from Asia. And so there was a lot of green light, no green light, green light, no green light you know you could you we we've been sent back from this ismalia um place this um you know there's a lot of checkpoints we went we go and then we were sent back and so there was a lot of waiting around and um ups and downs of we're going in we're not going in we're going in we're not going in so finally after 10 days or so we were able to go into uh, north sinai um, area, which is very restricted um, to non-local um, people. So it was really hard to get into this region as well. But finally, we got in uh, to the small town called Alrish. And this is actually usually a small town that only military people stay at, um, no foreigners whatsoever. But because of the uh, Gaza uh, crisis going on, it had become a hub for uh, supplies coming in, you know, such as through uh, the UN and whatnot. So we were able to manage to stay here. The idea was to just stay here for one night and then go in the Rafa border. But that was difficult, kind of the same issue where there was a green light, a little bit of confusion, not. So we ended up staying uh, for four days. Um, but uh, the last day, um, actually, before some visas were going to expire uh, in Egypt, we did our last ditch try and we were able to enter the Gaza Strip through uh, Rafa border. So this is the team at the Rafa crossing, um, crossing by foot. Um, we all had our bags with our supplies and this is the, uh, the first emergency response team. Our activities were in Han Yunus, uh, which is in the middle of the Gaza Strip. And at that time, the situation was that the north of Gaza Strip, uh, strip such as Gaza City, um, was uh, under attack and dangerous. So people from the north were coming down to Han Yunus, which is in around the middle area. And this is where we were having our medical activities. November 14th was the day that we finally were able to cross the border. Um, as you can see on the picture on the right, um, we the, the locally hired staff that MSF was working with were able to pick us up. And I really remember how happy they, they looked. Um, there were two members on the team who they came back. They had worked in Gaza before and it was kind of a reunion. Um, and also just just the reunion, other than the reunion, it was the sense of, you know, there's an international team who uh, came in all the way from their countries um, to such a dangerous area. And um, I, I felt like it was a small glimpse of hope that really lightened up everybody's faces um, when the international team came in. There was a lot of unknowns, as I said, and um, the we anticipated maybe the MSF clinic that uh, was treating burns and and uh, and small traumas. Uh, it still probably had electricity and had a, a salinization um, uh, thing uh, to to filter their water. And um, we, this was the first plan to to go there first and and at least stay there. Um, this is the food and supplies we brought in from Gaza, um, lots of canned foods and dry food, and then also we brought in some medications. Um, this was actually separate from the supplies that had come in. Um, it was mainly for staff, the locally hired staff and ourselves, um, just in case uh, somebody got sick. So Nasser Hospital, 
Um, this is the main hospital that uh, we worked at at this time. Um, unfortunately, it is no longer functional. It is the biggest hospital um, south of Gaza Strip. And it has a capacity for about 300 to 400 beds. At this time, uh, there was so many people who had evacuated from the north, uh, civilians, you know, not, not sick or, or patients, um, medical staff who had used to work at the big hospitals up north, such as um, Shifa Hospital, Indonesian Hospital, medical staff there had actually evacuated and moved down south. Many of them had lost their houses, so they were actually living inside and around this uh, Nasser Hospital. Nasser Hospital is actually a complex. Uh, within within uh, a complex, there is multiple buildings. And uh, this is the main building where the ER and IC ICU was at. Uh, MSF had already been operating in this annex building, um, which had an operational theater and some uh, wards, some beds in. So this is where uh, the, the surgical team actually worked, um, kind of rejoined the, the locally hired staff that had been working for MSF. There were actually Ministry of Health staff as well. Um, and we worked there mainly. And this is this main building where the ER was and the ICU was. Um, usually, MSF was not working there, but this time, uh, some of us just joined it, just jumped in um, to work with the, the MOH staff there. And this is the lobby. Um, this hospital was always, always so crowded. Um, just packed with with patients, civilians, and medical staff, and it was pretty chaotic. And there was always media. Um, we commuted about ten minutes to the hospital. Um, there, there were already destroyed buildings um, and such. So this was the the place that we worked with, worked at. Um, and then, so um, we entered on November fourteenth. Um, during our stay of three weeks, uh, there was that temporary ceasefire, which things calmed down, such as I remember um, the moment we got into Gaza, we always, always heard these drones buzzing, and that was the background noise. And on November 24th, I remember that the drones stopped, um, and it was very quiet and strange. And um, anyway, day one, so there was some relief, meaning that, so the drone stopped, uh, bombing stopped, and then people uh, realized that it was safe to move, um, especially there was a lot of people to go back to their homes that were destroyed and check if there were any, um, uh, any of the belongings left. So there was a lot of um, different I guess, a uh, movement of the people in the city. Uh, there was a lot more, I feel like I, I saw more like smiles and, and, and relief in the faces of the people. Um, and also some people in the hospital had left probably to check on their home. So there is less people in the hospital. There were some supplies that also came in on day one. So it was a pretty hopeful day, I remember. And then despite that, though, day two, um, it was a little different. Now, day two, we started to receive patients uh, from the north who were unable to walk, um, severely injured, very, very sick in critical condition, who came in in buses um, from the north. So Nasser Hospital, um, already being full and crammed, mo about three times as the capacity um, had to receive even more patients who were critically ill. And by the way, the patients who were in Nasser Hospital, a, a lot of times didn't have a house to go back to. Um, and many of them were so too sick to be discharged anyway. Um, so it, it, un unless patients died, um, patients kept on accumulating and soon we the Nasser hospital ran out of beds and um, patients were on the the floor being treated and the first time ever the hospital director requested 
uh, made an announcement that Nasser Hospital is just so full that you cannot receive adequate treatment. Um, so a different kind of crisis was happening during ceasefire, actually. And I also remember this time, um, not the trauma patients, but medical patients increased. Um, I think it was a I, safe opportunity for the patients who were getting sicker and sicker um, from such uh, infections, um, mainly, or worsening of their chronic illnesses who were coming in for Nasser Hospital. Just for um, examples, it was uh, elderly people who had to live out um, outside who were getting pneumonias, um, sepsis, which is a very, very uh, critical uh, condition of infections just getting worse and worse because there's no treatment. There were patients who had um, uh, diabetes who were not able to get their medications and getting more sick. There was something called diabetic ketoacidosis, just an extreme uh, worsening of the diabetes. Uh, dialysis patients who were unable to get dialysis, um, arrhythmias, because they're running out of their medications, just so many medical cases on top of the infected wound patients who came from uh, North and it, on top of everybody who had been there already. And it was, it was just such chaotic um, that everybody was really, really desperate um, for more room, for more uh, medication, supplies, whatnot. And there was an outage of uh, electricity at that time. Um, operations continued with cell phone lights, um, you know, and there was trying to build more beds um, outside because of the lack of space. Um, the operational room. So we saw a lot of children, young patients, um, babies, uh, toddlers, there's a word, a terminology called Wounded Child Non-Surviving Family, WCNSF, which is a, a condition that I saw a lot, that we, we've been seeing a lot. Um, it is children who are severely injured and are in the hospital, get treatment, but nobody in the family has survived. Um, the airstrike or or attacks um, that the family was under. So it, some babies, um, some toddlers um, with severe injuries, you 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 kind of have to wonder as a provider that even if you save these lives, what happens? You, you, you know that even if you treat a patient, it's not just that one time and everything else is good. You need support for a long time, multiple different uh, care medically, but also you need support from your family um, to recover. And it, it, is, it is such a long-term treatment that you you wonder what what kind of life is this child going to live so since seeing many many children including a 10 year old uh, girl who lost her leg um well actually had a a, a multiple multiple um very complex uh lower limb lower limb uh, fracture who you kind of knew that needed an uh, amputation. Sure enough, um, the next day we wanted to do an amputation. She, of course, she was intubated. She had severe burns, um, had to get a consent from her family, but she, we had no family to consent. And th this was a pretty recurring um, condition that uh, was very, very depressing. Um, other than this, I've seen uh, young female uh, one was a physician, um, one was a pharmacist who had lost um, all of uh, their children. Um, they would have two, three young children and they, they, they've died already. And I was told um, by the staff, this patient, this young uh, female, she's a doctor um, who doesn't know she lost all of her three kids. Of course, this doctor has 
severe, severe injuries. Um, she needs to be amputated um, and she's had back surgery. So it, it was it was really, really depressing um, situation um, multiple, multiple times that we were seeing in the operational um, operational room. Um, ER. I was going back and forth between the OT and the ER. This is the ER. Uh, which was, of course, always, always super crowded, um, not enough beds. These pictures, by the way, when I take pictures, it's when the situation is relatively calm and quiet. Um, there was many, many situations where there is mass casualties, um, a wave of 20 patients, um, half of them are dead, 10 of them very critical that we had to treat. And Sure, of course, there's no pictures of them, but this is when it was relatively calm. Of course, there's not enough medications. You know, this is kind of like um, the remainder of the medications that were allocated for the day. Um, equipment was very um, limited, primitive. This is a ventilator. This is the EKG machine. There was only one each. Um, and then the, uh, this is the laryngoscope. There was only two for so many intubations that were going on. And of course, severe injuries. This is one of the, um, pieces of the bombs that, uh, that was embedded in a patient's, um, back. Um, so a lot of things in the, in the, um, ER as well. Um, one other thing that uh, I would like to highlight is that MSF um, being an organization that has strong logistics um, supplies. So medical people by themselves really can't do much. You, you need supplies, logistics, environment to be able to uh, provide your medical skills. And so when we arrived, this is a warehouse right next to the MSF clinic uh, that we stayed at. Um, there was some supplies that had already arrived. Um, we weren't so sure what exactly was there. So this is the orthopedist. This is a general surgeon. You know, like we kind of turned into a we'll check the inventory um, of the, the warehouse and we identified what could be uh, used immediately. And we brought uh, medical supplies such as medications, um, you know, these kind of like uh, uh, sterile um, sheets, um, monitors, ultrasound machines and, and those and such and such, which I think was very helpful for what was what the situation was. And this was the second um, shipment that uh, we we kind of checked, um, went through um, kind of um, towards the end of our stay. So supplies was a thing that we uh, did. I wanted to show these children. Okay, so these children um, were uh, a big group of children, multiple families who were staying at the house across the street from the MSF clinic um, and, and warehouse that, that we were staying at. Um, in Gaza, a lot of uh, families uh, help each other. So uh, there's so many families who've lost their houses. So uh, far, far relatives, um, who still have houses, uh, you know, um, receive uh, their, their relatives. So this is a house that had a group of, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 people and maybe 20 children who were across the street and they would come up to you and they don't get to go to school anymore. Um, in, in school, they've learned English and a lot of neat things that they were really interested in, but things had stopped since the war. So they were very, very, um, I would say they were hungry for some stimulation. So they really wanted to engage with the MSF international team who was there. And, and they were super duper cute. <laughs> and, uh, and you can hear the drones.
So um, I wanted to say that um, I was already feeling depressed uh, like every single day because what I've seen, what I've been seeing in the, in the OR and the ER, and then you come home and every morning for maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes. And then when you come home, 10, 15 minutes, you have these wonderful, wonderful, super cute children under the buzzing sound of drones who come up to you and just, um, and just so precious. Um, so many children have died um, in this war. Uh, just from, this is a very old um, um, stats, but from October 7th to, this is a statistic from uh, to November 7th, that 6,000 children have died in that one month. For comparison, you, there's, there's statistics for in 2019, the the total children deaths are 4000 in the total of one year 4000 this was including syria afghanistan um yemen you know all those all those countries with all those conflicts going on 4000 in one year and then from 2020 to 2022 there it's it's a range of from about 2000 to 3000 children's deaths from conflict per day it's 134 per day in Gaza, compared to three per day in, uh, this was Syria, um, two per day in Afghanistan and 0 0.7 per day in Ukraine. So you can tell how 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 different um, the numbers are and how, how severe and, and a, a different level this war is. Another thing that is a whole different level is the tax on medical care, um, the frequency, the 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 just just the the blunt. I mean the 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 aggressiveness of the tax on medical care is a whole different level in Gaza Strip um, as well. So this was filmed by MSF staff. This was a MSF clinic that was attacked and MSF cars that were ran over by tanks and set on fire. So th this, this is serious, a very different level. And also three MSF doctors were killed. And this is some words that uh, this Dr. Abu Nujalia um, had written, and then he was killed. And then this is what happened to the board that he, he wrote some words on. So this, just, just, to, just, just for an idea, this is us, uh, the, the international emergency team, um, who, uh, in terms of the, the, the life in Gaza, um, was, and it was only three weeks. It was rough. Everybody lost weight. Everybody looked 10 years older than when they first came in. People were tired, stressed by the end of three weeks. If you think about it, it we are so lucky that it was only three weeks. Um, you know, like we were, I, I'm about to play a, a video about, uh, this is what I filmed, you know, what we were hearing all night. Um, this is, you know, like the, the shower bucket. So there's water, you know, there's limited water, um, there's limited, uh, electricity. So, you know, uh, we had to scoop, um, some water and then shower. Um, and then, so this is a picture I took, but yeah, this is just one of the nights that um, you hear. So the drones and then the strikes you can hear.
and I was filming this in bed um, under, you know, in the, in the sleeping, um, yeah, uh, the sleeping bag. So, so imagine you have to go through this. People have to tolerate this since October 7th and have no exit, have nowhere else to go, nowhere safe to go. So we had to exit Gaza on December 7th. From around December 4th, we were told not to go out, not to move anywhere. Um, so the the picture on the right was us uh, leaving and near Rafa crossing, which was supposed to be a safe zone, but we already saw so many buildings that were destroyed already. Um, so yes, uh, you know, um, when I was in Gaza, uh, people really, really um, asked us to to talk about, you know, what was going on in Gaza um, as much as possible, um, not to forget uh, what was going on. So MSF Pan um, has been doing things, you know, from, from early on. So a lot of um, advocacy, speaking out, there was a joint conference with ICRC, um, there's been a lot of media exposure, um, thanks to the comms department. Um, this has been continuous and still going on. There's been a petition campaign, which uh, we've gathered 100,000 signatories um, and submitted it to the Japanese government. And then um, there's been uh, press conferences, a talk event. There, this, this was with three staff who were in Gaza before the war started. Um, and then some engagement with uh, uh, the uh, parliament of the government of Japan. So this is still ongoing. And um, MSF Japan, we really, really um, plan to continue to do this to push for change in the situation. Immediate and sustained ceasefire is something that we've been pushing for anyway, um, but we will continue to do that. Um, and also, yes, um, it, it's just continued, continued uh, advocacy um, that we are doing. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the detailed explanation. We work for SMS. F Korea and we've been listening to the stories and the news from Gaza Strip and to hear once again from you the horrific stories from you uh, that makes our heart break break and also now we would like to start the Q&A and as you mentioned the conflict is ongoing in Gaza Strip and there are a lot of people who will be um, hurt who will be injured and they'll be coming to the hospital and at the same time uh, the medical facilities the medical staff are also targeted and a few days ago on 21st uh, there was a shelter that were warehouse where, where it housed the MSF staff, and it was targeted. And unfortunately, two of our staff uh, passed away, and six people were injured. And Doctor Yuko came back to Japan, and and you held a press conference, and you mentioned that you felt like you almost you could lose your life on November twenty third and December first. And I know you worked in so many fields and you mentioned that in those two days you felt the threat that you might lose your life so I would like to understand how did you cope with this life-threatening moments during your work in Gaza and you were in the U.S. and in order to cross the Rafa cross uh Rafa border and you wanted to go to the Gaza Strip as soon as possible and so we are working in an office so it's really when we see the field workers like you who I want to understand your heart like what made you want to go there as soon as possible um Yes, it's it's strange. It's not just me, but I think all all the team members from that first team, the emergency response team going in, I I, I think it's I don't know. It's 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 the route. 
um, I feel like of, of our existence. And it's, for me, it was instinctive. It was not, not any sort of reason, but it was just instinct to go. Um, in terms of the, you know, kind of feeling that, oh, I might die tonight. Uh, it, it was kind of expected, uh, meaning we were, we were informed that this is a very, very, uh, just super high risk, um, different level um, than before project. Do you, are you really sure you want to go in? And that was briefed to us multiple, multiple, multiple times. And we were also told once you go in, you don't, we don't know when you can go out. So that, that was, um, scary, but also expected. We all understood, um, the implications of going in. So for me, it was, I, I felt, I felt this might be the night I felt bad. Um, you know, if I do die, you know, I, I just felt bad for my family. Um, but I, it, you know, I was okay with that. I still wanted to, to do what I felt instinctively I wanted to do. And also um, my team members, I, I remember I had a ICU um, doctor, uh, pediatric, uh, pediatric ICU doctor from England, um, Gavin, and um, he he has two kids, and I did not, and he was always talking with his kids, and I I I didn't really, I wasn't so sure for him because I, I we don't have any kids, but I was like, are you really sure? But he also had this exact same question as me. He was like, this is the 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 reason I became a doctor, um, you know, this is the reason I exist. My family understands that. I feel sorry, but this is just my instinct. So I think I think it was a group of just kind of those kind of extreme people. And we were just, we just wanted to go in so bad. Um, so every time there was a green light, we were going in, everybody was so excited. And then we was like, no, 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 there's the, it's not a green light. Let's wait, let's try again tomorrow. Everybody was so disappointed. So yes, that's, you know, I, I think people just understood, um, you know, what the situation was. Yes. When I hear such courageous stories from the activist, I think once again to myself, really the meaning of MSF and I just look back upon my commitment as well. And as Dr. Yuko, you mentioned, as an anesthesiologist, I got the idea that it might have been even more difficult as an anesthesiologist with the shortage of medical supplies. I did hear that it was situation was very difficult. From the media, what we heard was that there was no anesthesiology equipment available. So when you needed to do amputation surgeries, there were cases that you have to do with without putting them under. And those were the severe situations that you were faced with. And you also talked about the little girl during your presentation as well. So such surgeries if you have to perform such surgeries without anesthesiologies, when you were at the field, how many cases of like that did you actually see? Was it frequent? Is it a situation that occurs often nowadays there? And then in that process, I think there will be patients who suffer severe psychological damage as well. Could you share your story on that? Yes. Um, when we arrived, um, it, it, fortunately, there was minimum, minimum uh, anesthetics um, and sedatives. Uh, this is a little technical, but for example, for the inhaled anesthetics, they had something called isoflurin. Um, you could, yes, you could do surgeries with that but it's not ideal, especially for children. Um, there's many different kinds of inhalant um, anesthetics. And uh, 
So it, it was, I would say, I would say it was kind of like that. They had a little bit of ketamine, um, some, some morphine, some fentanyl. So they, they had a minimum amount, which they were very, very uh, rationalizing. Um, so uh, they were managing, I would say. Um, so my, me, myself, I did not have to do any cases without with with like zero anesthetics, but there was some minimal. So the first couple days, uh, yes, there, there it was anesthesia with just isoflurane and just a little bit of limited um, anesthesia. Um, but that, you know, we found like sevoflurane, uh, a better kind of uh, inhaled anesthetic in the supplies that had arrived already. So that was something that we bought in. Um, so for the OR, th there wasn't any cases with zero anesthetics. Um, probably, but the other MSF hospitals, which MSF has been working in, like in the north or so, I, I yes, I've heard um, from from the, the staff that worked there who evacuated from the north that that had to be done. And I cannot imagine the, the trauma because I, I, I do see patients who have like burns from the past or or like like in my home countries um, or amputations from the past and it still hurts you know there's there's phantom limbs and um, you know deep burns hurt all the time you know like years and years after um, the injury so I it's it's really hard to imagine the 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 amount of pain like not only at that time but long term that it would cause for the rest of your life so so that's that um in the er there there was there was cases um that the the er staff would run out of anesthetics and sedatives um the the er had a this was the moh policy um rationalized um the amount of medications that could be used in 24 hours um this was unnegotiable um even when we got the the mass casualties you know i asked can't we ask them to to kind of increase a little bit of more of the medication but i think it was a, a long term planning or something that that was not able to be changed so anyway um the er oftentimes um run ran out of anesthetics and sedatives uh, like especially you know towards the end of the day because in the morning they they get the medications um and then yes um you know like some sutures lacerations reductions um was done without uh, anesthetics So I understand they're lacking medical supplies and also it is difficult to bring things to the Gaza Strip and I understand they may run out of the uh, supplies and MOH has to manage the supplies and I think it is very difficult to work with the situation and it seems like the patients have cut injured uh, they have various wounds and according to World WHO since there are a lot of patients who are not treated on time because of the lack of supplies, a lot of them have inflammation. And have you seen uh, patients like that? Or And also the diarrhea, the skin issues. So there are various um, like diseases that can be caused by that. And also you also mentioned about the chronic diseases um, who with diabetes and they're not able to get the, the regular supplies that they need. And so they're living their everyday life with them. So how are they being treated? Is it the case that they are not receiving any treatment, but are they trying to survive without the medicine? What's happening for them? Um, yes. So infections. Yes, there's a lot and there's many different kinds of infections. Um, yes, due to the lack of medications, antibiotics, and lack to a clean environment and also lacked access of, of, of being able to uh, keep the wounds clean or debride or, or whatnot. Um, the, the, the continuation of care, that's all lacking because all the in infrastructure, everything is destroyed in Gaza. So the, the types of infections I saw um, you know, there's the, the wounds that are kind of subacute that has 
been so people got severely injured a couple weeks ago those wounds because of inadequate uh, hygiene and care antibiotics they are infected so the infections are bad and then the infections had gone around the body so it's it's in a the patients were a lot of times in a situation condition called sepsis just infection just severely um, that spread around the, the body um, so we saw that kind of infection. We saw like medical types of infections, which are uh, diarrhea, yes, like dehydration, um, uh, severe illness in children, um, even when they're not injured, um, you know, and the elderly, anybody who has a little bit of weaker, you know, immune system, very, very susceptible um, to, to get these kind of infections. So diarrhea and also upper respiratory infections, you know, there's some, uh, uh, like, like hepatitis that I've heard of, you know, meningitis. So there's a lot of infections, um, because, um, also the, the, just, just the crowdedness of, you know, when you're in a, uh, when you're evacuated and just crammed into a school or, or, you know, in the hospital, everything was crammed as well. Everybody was just staying in the hospital, um, that, that spreads easily. So that kind of infections. And then the, the, um, the, the people who have to stay outside and, and whatnot, the elderly, um, who, Yes, I saw a lot of pneumonias that just got so bad, urinary tract infections, you know, who who we see in Japan, in the US, you know, that are kind of, um, you know, if you if you treat at an early stage are very treatable. Um, but if it gets bad, and you, if you go into sepsis, it's hard to treat. Um, a lot of patients were in that condition. Um, the chronic illness patients, uh, yes, I mean, not surprisingly, um, many of them ran out of their medications. They just don't have uh, their their hospitals or clinics that they used to be able to go to to fill their medications. So not surprisingly, their conditions just, just got worse and to the extreme point that, and then they had to wait to be able to come to, to Nasser Hospital because it was unsafe to to move, you know, in the streets to to come to the the hospital. So that's why they, we saw a lot during ceasefire. Yes, while you were answering, I think we also got a question in the chat. If you could provide a quick answer to that, that would be very much appreciated. So I think the lack of supplies, infrastructure on the field, and there were so much restrictions that you had to overcome. So when it's difficult to treat the patient 100% under such conditions, as MSF active, activists, what was your top priority? What was your number one goal? Hmm. Um. Yes, many things were just so limited. I would say we just did what we could with what we have. And it's just not us, but everybody who was working there, the Palestinian uh, medical staff, the doctors, um, they did whatever they could. A lot of them were were working uh, nonstop since since October 7th and um, you know they 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 are exhausted but they kept on working even when they're supposed to rest um, checking on their patients um, they really were good at knowing okay uh, we don't have this type of medication so this we can use instead or uh, they 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 just know the difference between you know before uh, all this started um, and then after it started and the, what the limitations are. So I guess in terms of priority, it, yeah, it was, it was just trying our best to, 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 yeah, to do what's best for the patient. I mean, it's the same, the, the basic medicine is the same as, as for me, you know, for, for working in the U S and Japan, it's just to, to, you know, first of all, it's the stabilization um, you know, to, to save a life, the stabilization. Um, and that, that was the priority, but also if you think about the continuation of care, the quality of life, 
that was where you kind of get very um, depressed because you know that that that's going to be very, very challenging. Yes. The MSF, we are trying to save lives and we're driving to save lives. We have that slogan. I think your words and your answers speak very loudly to those mandates that we have. The medical staff are under attack with the restriction of medical supplies. Under the circumstances, you're doing your very best with what you have, even now. There are so many doctors of MSF and also other humanitarian organizations that are on the field, even now. I would like to support them all with my heart. I do want to ask another question. There were advocacy activities from the MSF Japan and also a lot of communication department activities as well. MSF Korea also is working on various communication activities from MSF Korea as well. After the attack occurred in October, there were messages that we sent out to urge ceasefire. And afterwards, fairness, neutrality, I think there were also people who have raised questions on MSF's stance and perspective on issues and matters. Why is MSF in a war between Israel and Palestine are actively st staying in Gaza Strip where a conflict is ongoing? Are you not a neutral organization? We get such questions or suspicions, I guess. If we get such concerns or questions raised, Dr. Yuko, would you have an opinion? Um, okay, I think my answer would be very simple. MSF, as, as you know, like as, as a baseline goes wherever access to medicine, to healthcare is lacking. Uh, that is necessary. In Gaza, yes, obviously it's it's necessary. It's lacking. Um, just to be clear, MSF has offered uh, Israel uh, help or or support um, if needed, um, and that that was not uh, necessary. I guess that was not requested. So there's an offer that was to both um, and where the medical care response is necessary is, is Gaza. So I think for myself, um, I'm just uh, a doctor who goes to the field where it's necessary. And even without political, I guess, constraints or opinions, you just treat the people who are in need, who are injured, who are sick. And, and it is as simple as that to me. And it's not, I mean, even before politics, it's just humanity. And whoever you are, uh, you know, if you're, if you're uh, on this side or that side, if you're sick, if you're injured, if you need medical treatment, MSF just treats. And it, I, I think that's MSF's principle, like no matter on which side you are, you just treat. Um, so yeah, actually, I without any political opinions, uh, that's, that's what I do as a doctor. So that's kind of my position. Yes. I think MSF, as you mentioned, Fairness, neutrality, I think that was the perfect answer, really embodying what we stand for. MSF has operations not only in Gaza, but we are trying to look beyond race, beyond uh, ethnicity, beyond religion, and trying to save the patient, the people in need in front of us. When we 
Oh, normally this is the time that we close our webinar, but I do have one last question to Dr. Yugo. So most of the people who are participating in the call today are, I guess, third-party observers to what's happening in Gaza. Me, myself, working at MSF Korea, are only being able to access what's happening in Gaza through the contents on media. So us being one step apart, just as the general public, for the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, what can we do? Are there any things that we can do to help, if you could answer that? Um, yeah, uh, this is what I question myself as well. I, of course, you know, demanding for ceasefire. This is a very, very fundamental and simple and fixing the root of the cause thing um, is is important, immediate and sustained ceasefire. And this is, I think, the biggest thing, of course, uh, stopping attacks on medical care, um, you know, increasing access to humani uh, humanitarian um, supplies, whatnot, is, is important. But and and all of this, I know MSF is 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 pushing for is demanding. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. And I do think uh, not giving up and continuing to do that. Um, and I think with the, the, uh, a, a critical mass, you know, the politicians, um, you know, the pressure on, on diplomacy that could change, you know, like elections coming up, uh, whatnot, you know, there, there is, I think it's just important to continue to do that. Um, although, you know, so far it's it's not working, you know, it may work um, soon. So I think that's the most important thing um, to continue to do. So raising this kind of awareness of what's going on. Um, there's 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 real stuff going on. And I know the media is is a little bit, um, I guess, uh how do you say like not, um based on you know the 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 public's interest you know could um be not not be reporting you know as much as when it first started um because it's just been going on however the situation is getting worse so i think just knowing that um and also not giving up and continuing to put pressure is one big thing fixing the root of the cause thing that, that we can do. Now, there's a little bit of more tangible things um, going on, like domestically, um, when a, which is not like a uh, like an international big type of thing, but a little more close local thing that I think can work on. For example, like in Japan, this is me personally, um, but I, I feel like the um, you know, the, the UNRWA funding, um, you know, a, a little bit of like di di diplomatic um, pressure, that kind of stuff um, could be a little more tangible um, things that, that the public can push for and, and just mass critical and continued pressure, I think, could work on. Um, yes. And then so just talking about it, raising awareness, um, sharing thoughts. Um, I think is most most important. There's the other things, um, but yes, I will leave it to there for now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuko. I think when I first entered, uh, joined MSF Korea, I, I learned about Speak Out. So voicing your opinion when necessary so even if it's not something that's happening right in front of your eyes, a humanitarian crisis on another part of the globe, you should talk about that with your friends and voice and speak out so that no more people are made aware of this situation. Dr. Yuko, I know that you're very busy. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation for your participation in today's session. And lastly, uh, could I ask for some parting words from your side to the participants? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, for this opportunity to share, I 
feel like, you know, this is, this is one of the things that we were, the international team members were asked, tasked to do um, from the people in Gaza who are really, really enduring this hardness, um, ha having to deal with all the issues um, going on, unimaginable for people like us who are fortunate enough um, to be born in such a country who doesn't have to be in the middle of a war. So I think my duty, um, at least, is to to try to help. And I know it's not enough, um, but try to uh, kind of gather members, you know, t teammates who who could be able to just do, um, just just give back. Um, because we're so fortunate um, to, to give back, you know, what we can do um, to the people who unfortunately uh, had to be in the middle of a war and, and this really hard um, situation. So I thank everybody who were interested in, in hearing about what happened and also, you know, all the support in many different ways um, to, to be able to, you know, share humanity. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I really, really uh, am thankful for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yuko. Yes, I think now then we should bring this briefing to a close. As was mentioned before, there has been more than 100 days passed since the war has uh, broke out. And the change, the circumstances are changing on a daily basis. I looked at the media coverage here, and about thirty thousand people have lost their lives. There have been evacuations and also attacks on medical care and facilities. And even with the medical staff that are staying there, they're forced to leave because of such deteriorating circumstances. MSF, in order to protect civilian lives, restore humanitarian aid routes, and rebuild the health system on which the survival of the people of Gaza depends on, reiterates once again its call for an immediate ceasefire. In order for us to work further in uh, providing the necessary care, regardless of race and religion, we ask for your continued interest and support. If you have any other questions about MSF today, or if you have any further questions for Dr. Yuko that you could not ask, please uh, come through us with our website, or even if you can leave your question through our email, and I will try to pass it on to Dr. Yuko and the people on the MSF side. And among the people who participated today, if there are people who want to join the MSF, if you have any questions on our recruitment next week on the 29th, we have also a recruitment session. So if you're interested, please block your schedule and join us so that you could get some answers to any open questions you may have. Thank you very much for your participation and I'll meet you at the next focus briefing. Thank you.